Dear Mr. Vernon, we accept the fact that we had to sacrifice a whole episode to watching John Hughes films, but we think you're crazy to make us write an essay telling you what we think of each one of them. You see his films as you want to, but we found out is that each one is funny, relatable, well-written, and nostalgic. Does that answer your question? This is Movie Night. Hello and welcome to Movie Night, YouTube's most watched movie review show. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. Tonight we'll take a look at three classic John Hughes films, which, like most of his work, primarily deals with teens and 20-somethings finding out their place in the world. We'll begin with The Breakfast Club. This now cult classic by famed director John Hughes was released in February of 1985 and eventually grossed 50 times its meager $1 million budget. One of the quintessential installments in the Brad Pack group of films, this coming-of-age comedy drama stars Emilio Estevez, Anthony Michael Hall, Judd Nelson, Molly Ringwald, and Ali Sheedy as five high school students forced to suffer through a detention together on a dreary Saturday afternoon, with Paul Gleason as their only supervisor. All the young adults do a fantastic job with their realistic teenage dialogue, easily bringing their well-developed characters to life, each one individually amusing in their own right. The original script by Hughes, reportedly written in just two days, perfectly understands their dilemmas, and although each character is a bit of an exaggerated stereotype, they play off one another very well. What begins as fart jokes and playful antics eventually transforms into a much deeper narrative that explores the pains and issues real adolescents struggle with in their daily lives, especially when Estevez poignantly remarks, we're all pretty bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it. As the mature voice of Reese and Gleason is great as the animated disciplinarian, but he's hardly the real bad guy the film makes him out as, even if it mayn't seem that way to younger audiences. Personally, I only saw this film for the first time recently as an adult, so I definitely went into it with a different perspective. I've seen finger gestures from such a pristine girl. Not that pristine. Are you a virgin? I'll bet you a million dollars that you are. Is it gonna be a white wedding? Why don't you just shut up? Have you ever kissed a boy on the mouth? Have you ever been felt up? Over the bra, under the blouse, shoes off, hoping to God your parents don't walk in. Although refreshing and amusing throughout, the 97-minute film is awkwardly paced and sort of aimlessly bounces from one scene to the next. Outside of a handful of some deliberately artistic shots, the cinematography and editing here is very low-key and conventional, with action on screen unraveling like a theatrical play, confined mostly to a single room, and impressively shot entirely in sequence. With the exclusion of the awesomely iconic original song Don't You Forget About Me by Simple Minds that bookends the film, most of the R-rated picture is left in complete silence. Dutifully exploring themes of self-worth, friendship, and growing up, this movie may not be exciting or particularly dramatic, but there's an undeniable warmth and charm to it that makes it required viewing for all fans of 80s cinema. The Breakfast Club. Timeless characters propel introspective script. Now let's go to the YouTube comments to see what you had to say about this movie. A 9 and a 7 for The Breakfast Club. You praise the writing, characters, and realistic situations, scoring this in awesome. Unquestionably, this film would have had a more profound impact on me had I gone around to watching it a decade ago. But as a mature adult, there was still much I enjoyed here, and I thought it was cool. For tonight's poll question, which member of The Breakfast Club do you identify with the most? Leave your response as a comment below. Next up, let's review Ferris Bueller's Day Off. This teen comedy was a massive hit in the summer of 1986 when it earned over 11 times its small $5 million budget. Writer, producer, and director John Hughes once again takes us inside the mind and life of an American teenager on one crazy day of adventures when he decides to skip school. Matthew Broderick stars as the title character, an aloof high schooler who shuns responsibility and lives in a dream world without consequences, often explaining his greedy actions via fourth wall breaking soliloquies, including his own personal mantra that bookends the film, life moves pretty fast, if you don't stop and look around once in a while, you can miss it. Alan Ruck and Mia Sarah play as two best friends and showcase excellent range of comedic timing as a threesome, bringing to life a very realistic and lived-in sort of friendship, all while evading their overzealous principal played by Jeffrey Jones in an amusing physical comedy type role. Jennifer Grey, Edie McClurg, Ben Stein, and a young Charlie Sheen also give great performances in smaller supporting roles. Although the movie has plenty of memorable moments, the landmark sequence is undoubtedly Broderick crashing Chicago's Van Steuben Day Parade and lip-syncing to Twist and Shout, with real-life Chicagoans playfully dancing along with him in the background. Here, give me the phone. I have another call. Huh. I've had enough of this horsing around. Give me the phone back. You touch me, I yell rat. 
There's another phone around here somewhere. Find it. Wonderful. I weep for the future. Okay, Ferris, can we just let it go, please? Ferris, please. Come on too far. You're gonna get busted. A, you can never go too far. B, if I'm gonna get busted, it is not gonna be by a guy like that. The film was a self-proclaimed love letter to the city of Chicago, with Hughes doing a fantastic job showing off many famous places and areas of his Windy City hometown, from the Sears Tower to the Art Institute, with wonderfully framed anamorphic shots. Kids and teens will surely enjoy this PG-13 rated picture, if only as a fantasy realized on the big screen. What if you could skip school for a day and live life large with your friends in the big city? Certainly plenty of fun and hilarity to go around, but the movie, especially its titular hero, is just shallow. The individual characters and endlessly quotable dialogue all work well, of course. Hughes's understanding and handling of teen emotions and thinking saves this picture. Reportedly, he wrote the entire script in under a week, and honestly, it shows. The disconnected scenes have little flow between them, and are mashed together for no other reason than to pad out the 103 minute runtime. There's no consequence to any of Bueller's actions, no remorse, humility, or lessons learned. In short, he's a terrible role model who treats his friends like crap, and gets away with it because the movie needed a materialistic happy ending. That said, a final race sequence to the suburbs of Chicago, set to the funky sounds of Yellow's Oh Yeah, are a great send-off to one of the more iconic characters of 80s cinema. Ultimately nothing more than a relatable, but empty and drawn-out experience that fails to really explore the teen psyche or ever impart any morals or wisdom. This is a disposable bit of fun I won't be clamoring to watch again anytime soon. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Pointless, overrated fluff that delights. Here's what you had to say in the YouTube comments. Our scores for Ferris Bueller's Day Off, an 8 and a 6. You love the characters and funny moments scoring this a great. While I definitely had fun watching the movie, Bueller just isn't a particularly likable character in my opinion, and since the whole premise rests on relating to his experiences, I was unfortunately underwhelmed. I'm rating this a good. Now a reminder to check out the Movie Night Archive channel for my trailer commentaries, and an organized library of all our past reviews. Finally tonight, let's discuss career opportunities. Grossing a modest $11 million when it was released in March of 1991, this Brian Gordon teen romantic dramedy rarely excites and generally feels like a low-budget made-for-TV movie. Taking place over the course of a long evening inside a Target department store, Frank Whaley stars as a lowly janitor who is working his first night shift alongside the criminally gorgeous Jennifer Connelly, a socialite daughter of a wealthy businessman. Whaley is decently endearing as the town liar, but isn't quite suited for leading man material. His character clearly hopes for something more out of his dead-end life, perhaps even the affection of an old high school crush, whom he now finds himself alone in the big store with all night. As a 21-year-old bombshell, Connolly is downright distractingly beautiful here, but the icing on the cake is the future Academy Award winner's acting chops, mixing subtle flirtation with frustrated anxiety impeccably well. Also, a scene where she rides a small mechanical horse is quite memorable. These are relatable characters struggling to figure out the next big step in their life, with Connolly countering Whaley's own self-deprecating outlook by saying, at least you have some control over your life, before lamenting about her own situations. I was debating... What? Whether or not to get arrested for shoplifting. Doesn't your father own like $10 million worth of real estate in this town? Well, it's not my fault. No, no, I, I didn't imply such. It just seems funny that someone of your... Uh, Wealth? If you will, would be shoplifting. I didn't do it. I chickened out. W would consider shoplifting. It's a long, dull, self-indulgent, highly unromantic story about an overbearing father, deceased mother and brother, and a completely confused girl. Looks a little like me. Even though the movie is extremely short at just 83 minutes, their chemistry has plenty of time to blossom, thanks largely in part to writer John Hughes's great dialogue. It's difficult not to root for their relationship to succeed, as you watch it unfold practically in real time. The PG-13 rated film has plenty of comedy hijinks afoot as well, like a quick cameo seen by the always amusing John Candy. The score by Thomas Newman isn't anything special, but repeated use of cheesy pop ballads helps cement the picture's mood. Mostly all of the camera work here are locked down, medium to wide shots, which does little to liven up the dull atmosphere of an empty department store. Just as the story begins to settle in and seriously examine the hardships and dilemmas facing wayward young adults, the plot does an about face for the absurd when a ridiculous burglary attempt is introduced. The goofy would-be thieves hold our protagonist hostage, and the playful and poignant romantic comedy thread is entirely abandoned for silly pratfalls and a rushed ending that leaves much to be desired. If not for some of the names attached to this project, there'd be no reason to see it, let alone watching it sometime again. Career opportunities. Resounding romance, if haphazardly delivered. And here's my score on the rate a 4. 
This film isn't nearly as interesting as Hughes' other coming-of-age adventures, and it's far too short to effectively finish the story it began. But some cute moments and Jennifer's astonishingly good looks make it worth seeing. But it's still just, meh. Now let's take a look at some tweet critiques to see what you're saying about movies currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPMN hashtag. Next week we'll take a look at superhero sequels, 1980's Superman 2, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, and of course the upcoming The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Once you've seen these films, share your opinions by voting in the polls below, or by leaving a comment review. If you'd like to watch more Movie Night reviews, check out the related videos on the right, or click subscribe to be notified of all new content. And be sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, or Instagram for updates between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.